Today's gospel reading is a serious challenge. We see one person who suffered in this life saved and another who had everything in this life condemned. Now, this parable is a challenge because we live in an age that many people assume that they're good, at least by their own definition of what's good, and so automatically go to heaven, uh, whatever going to heaven means. But this view of heaven in quotation marks doesn't fit with the gospel. The kingdom of heaven means life with and in participating in the very life and love of God. That's in the very life and love of God as we selflessly and faithfully live our lives out in service for the other. So to be with God, we are to desire that life above all else, to be rich towards God, to be rich towards others, and poor, as it were, towards the distractions and the temptations of worldly wealth and power, and poor, as it were, in insensitivity towards the needs of others. God is rich in love and rich in mercy and gives us opportunities to show love and mercy in serving others to the glory of God. So the big question really isn't what God does for us, but rather how will each one of us respond to the means that God entrusts to us? What are the means? Well, the scriptures, the sacraments, the liturgy, the writings of the saints, prayer, fasting, sacrificial giving, and so on, spiritual guidance. Do we employ the available God-given means for our growth in divine grace, in our opportunities to love, serve, and witness? Because really, when you think of it, unused tools are really of little to no value. We can run the risk of taking God and God's love and mercy for granted. Remember, we'll all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. We'll give an account for the way we've lived and what our response has been to God's gracious offer of life and love and union and communion with him. Some of the great saints have said that our judgment on the last day will be based on our oneness with God, how we love God now, how we say yes to God now in this life day to day. And the parable of the rich man and Lazarus is an example of such a judgment by self-examination, an opportunity for repentance, for growth, and for change. Because on that day, we won't be judged by Jesus bringing the gavel down and saying, you're guilty, you're going to hell. We'll stand judged by our own action or inaction. That's the frightful part for me. It's not me trying to form a defense for God when I die. No, it's what I've chosen right here and right, God, right now. What I've chosen to live, how I've chosen to love for God or against God, and God will honor that eternally. That is a frightful thing to me. It's easier just to have the soul float away and be with heaven and eat cream cheese on a cloud. The rich man treats Lazarus with scorn in this life. Did you notice in the next life, he does the same thing in a way. What's he, what's he say to Father Abraham? When he says the bosom of Abraham, that means in, fully in God's presence is what that means. What's he say? Send Lazarus to dip his finger in some water and bring it to me. So even there, he's still the, this fellow's servant. There's no sense of, of any kind of um, sorry or repentance or, gee, I missed the mark anything like that. He's, yes, he's caring about his own family, uh, I suppose. Uh, we could argue that for him. 
but still, let's send Lazarus that he can dip the tip of his finger in water and, and cool me off. I'm kind of warm in this situation. In this life, the man's God was wealth, plain and simple. He lives for his own selfish pleasure, sumptuously eating every day, fine linen and purple, the most expensive things to wear. He knows God because he says, Father Abraham, and Abraham responds with, my child, therefore he is a Jew, he is a Hebrew. He knows about God, but he doesn't know God. He doesn't love God, as we see his lack of concern for those around him. He's not concerned at all about what God's vantage point is as far as his life is concerned. Doesn't beg forgiveness. And meanwhile, Lazarus, full of sores, lay at his gate in this life, longing to eat the crumbs that fell from the rich man's table. We might say wanting to even eat the rich man's garbage. The rich man is very different than Lazarus. We don't ever hear of Lazarus yelling out at the rich man, calling him a miserable wretch. Lazarus dies. It is escorted to the bosom of Abraham, to the full presence of God. God's very presence. And having been deprived of his needs in this life, Lazarus enjoys the eternal heavenly banquet of true eternal life with God and God's saints. Lazarus enjoys eternal and perpetual remembrance before God. And that's very important. Remembrance before God. Why? Do you remember the thief on the cross next to Jesus? What did he say? Remember me in your kingdom. Lazarus is remembered because his name is mentioned. He's known to God. What's the name of the rich man? You got no name. There was never any relationship there. And that's solely by the choice of the rich man. He decided not to be in a loving relationship with God. He was in union and communion with this world. And what do we hear about him? That he was buried. And it's interesting how one of the old saints, uh, St. Saint John Chrysostom, puts it. About the rich man being buried. The rich man was already buried in this life. By his couches, his rugs, his furnishings, his sweet oils, his perfumes, his wine, his varieties of food, and the flatterers that surround him. Because these things surely were his God. And his God is time-based. And so it's all buried with him, but of no eternal value. This rich man lived for himself, his own self-pleasure in this life, is deprived of in, in eternity. And he isn't remembered. He has no name before God. Because God never knew him. God knows about him. But God never knew him. Well that puts many people in this position of kind of a. This is an us and them kind of a parable. I'm not like the rich man at all. Mm -hmm. Christ is asking us to examine ourselves closely in light of the rich man. All of us have been given riches in one form or another, in different measure, of course. And all of us will be asked what we have done with these riches that have been entrusted to us at Christ's return in glory. All will be asked how we demonstrated our love for God and those around us in need. This parable isn't condemning wealth. It's not money is the root of all evil. It's the lusting after money that's the root of all kinds of evil. It's not condemning wealth. 
It's a revelation of what happens if we allow our soul to become prideful, cold-hearted, selfish towards God and our neighbors and become poor, as it were, or stingy towards God and those around us. Already in this life, the rich man is withering and dying, separating himself for God in this life. And tragically, because God honors his decision unto ages of ages. There's no way back from that. I'll talk a little bit about that when I talk about the angels with the young people. So all of us need to be wary of this disease of wanting to have our comfort first and our using of others, even God, for our own ends. We have to be aware of the disease of cold-heartedness towards God and others. And we overcome this. The treatment for this is cooperating with the Holy Spirit. It's working with a spiritual mentor. It's reading the scriptures. It's studying the scriptures. It's examining how we're living now, how we're loving now, how we're serving now. And be with somebody that'll speak the truth and love to us. Because if we have ourselves as our own spiritual mentor, it's like being your own lawyer. You've chosen a fool for a client. It's about how much have we been willing to be Christ's light in the world, to speak the truth in love, to model the gospel in word and deed. To this end, it's helpful to periodically do an inventory of our riches, our material riches and our spiritual riches, to evaluate how we're using them for the kingdom that is our life with God, that is the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven, means the same thing. It's our life with God. The kingdom is within, Jesus said. The life of God dwells within the baptized faithful. How are we using the gifts, material and spiritual, in this world, in our life with God, in our becoming like God? St. Cyril of Alexandria, wonderful spiritual writer, spurs us on in living first for God, saying, Do not consider your riches as belonging to yourselves alone. Open your wide, open wide your hand to those who are in need. And St. Paul urges us to have our abundance supply another's lack, that their abundance in another area that we are in need may also supply what we lack. Thursday night, I was in hospice. Uh, Ross was there, Wally was there, I was there. We had our Thursday night group. And it'll continue on by God's grace. And anybody that would like to come out is certainly welcome. Another's lack, another's abundance. He was not well. He slept a lot of the time, but he participated as well. No doubt about that. Always with a sense of humor. I looked at him and I said, you may not know this, Wally, but even in the state you're in, or I use something of that kind of terminology, you're still ministering. Ross could complete the story, I'm sure. You're still ministering to people. And he didn't get it. I said, you're smiling. You're saying thankful for those that are helping you when you're in this state, when you're low. And the nurses said to Ross, uh, when Wally died, you're at such peace. There was a little text, remember I sent that to you? Be at peace and many around you will be healed. Right? That's what it's about. Even in our poorness, even in the dying body of a parishioner named Wallace Lotto, 
He's still ministering the reality of Christ Jesus to others by being kind and not crotchety, by giving of what he has with, with at that moment was nothing. Nothing material, nothing bodily, but spiritually strong. And for that, I eternally give thanks. If we strive to live this way as the body of Christ, as the family of God, supplying what the church and each other lack, whichever that might be, peace, a smile, kindness, self-control, material riches, whatever it might be, we grow in our union with a father, a heavenly father that so dearly loves us, that's willing to go to all lengths to be in eternal union and communion with us. That's willing even to say no to the one that cries out, let this cup pass from me. That's the crux of the situation. All day long, God puts before us situations that we have to decide, do I want this cup to pass from me? Or do I take up my cross? No matter the situation in life I'm in, even when I'm dying in a bed in hospice, do I pick up my cross and do as Christ would do?